Chris, our, oh, there you are. I'm, brilliant. You could have you. Where's Kurt on the old computer? I, I, I did the old thing of turning it off and back on again. Do you know, just can I re just jump on that, everybody? My phone stopped streaming and I got a lot of stuff down my phone a couple of days ago. Two whole days and two evenings, couldn't work it out. Computer girl, she said, switch off your hub, your uh, internet thing, switch it back on. It picks up sound. You just, that's all you have to do. So on and off is brilliant. Thank you very much, Andrew. And we've got Chris and uh, Alan in the background. And we've got Linda there as well. And that's the team that's got, that makes all this work. So thank you. In particular, Andrew, because I know how busy you are being a hospitalist. And I know you've got catch up with having to be redeployed because of COVID and everything. Are you well? And the family well? Yes, yeah, not bad. Thank you. We've uh, we've avoided redeployment on this round so far. So we're still trying to keep the, uh, the, the bread and butter going. That's the liver service. So, uh, so we've avoided it thus far. Yeah. We are far more interesting. Of course we are. Of course we are. Right. Now, some good questions, some difficult ones, some easy ones, okay? So does Omicron affect PBC and in, in particular liver and pancreas specifically? It's quite a good question because you could apply that to Omicron or any other of the variants, couldn't you? Yeah. So um, in terms of, you know, COVID doesn't sort of uh, exacerbate uh, PBC itself. Um, however, um, coronaviruses generally do have a, uh, a predisposition, if you like, to sort of attach themselves to certain tissues, and some of those tissues can involve the bile ducts. Um, there are chemicals uh, that, that are produced that are sit within the bile ducts that, that, the, uh, that the virus will attach itself to. Um, and uh, we have seen people with COVID infection get abnormal liver blood tests, and often that's actually where the rise in the alkaline phosphatase enzyme that we see in people with PBC. Um, so, so we've seen that in a proportion of patients. The more severe your COVID, the more likely you are to have some liver test arrangements, but it's very rarely severe, and it usually all settles down once the acute you know, inflammation from the virus and the infection goes away. So there's nothing to suggest that Omicron will make your PBC any worse, but it could cause a slight elevation in your liver tests from a direct viral effect on the on the bile ducts within the liver or within the liver cells themselves. Um, other variants, there's no suggestion that this does it any more frequently than, <coughs> than the other variants that we've seen thus far. So so there's not a direct association, but we, we do see abnormal liver tests with, uh, with COVID. Would it not be fair to say as well, like that? that's a really good question because I know some people, you can imagine they contact me, their liver function's gone up and I'll say, yeah, but you look at trends. But yeah. is it not fair to say, and a virologist told me sometime way in the distant past, that sometimes there are other things that can make your liver function change yeah. temporarily, mm -hmm. um, and a common cold or, yeah. you know, various, and, and the common cold is part of the whole SARS thing or, or COVID, isn't it? So it be, is it not fair to say that there's a few things that can actually change the liver function of it temporarily? Absolutely. I mean, much broader than just a discussion around Omicron and, and COVID is, is as, you, as you rightly say, so medications, other viruses can cause inflammation of the liver, just generalised infections from, from bacterial to other viruses. So um, the thing with PBC is that it's a, it's a relatively consistent disorder in terms of the way it affects your blood tests. You, you don't get very classically swinging liver tests with PBC. So if your alkaline phosphatase is elevated, it tends to stay elevated at a similar level unless you're on treatment, which brings it down. So if it's been stable for a long time and then, and then the alkaline phosphatase suddenly shoots up, it's often for other reasons. Um, obviously, you make sure that people are, are still taking their medications, but actually um, the ALP will tend to be quite stable in PBC. So sudden changes as, as, as liver doctors, we're always looking out for those other conditions uh, that actually don't mean your PBC's got worse. It just means to say there's another reason for your liver tests to, to be elevated. And very often those will be short lived, like, like a virus, like a bacteria or, or a new medication. And of course, there's always the, that horrible word, gallstones as well. One of the doctors mm -hmm. was telling us some time ago that, you know, we're not immune to gallbladder disease and gallstones and things, and that can really rocket the, the liver counts, can't they? Absolutely. <clears throat> what did they used to say in the old days, fair, fat and 40? I'm not fair, I'm definitely not fat, and I'm definitely not 40, so I'm all right. Okay, 
Now we get asked this quite a lot. Can I take a multivitamin and minerals when I have PVC? I'm not quite sure what this person means by minerals because I think that's a you know a very broad, broad spectrum there. But multivitamins anyway. Uh, yes, I mean I think generally speaking, you know most um, most simple multivitamin preparations are quite safe. Uh, we always ask people to exercise caution when taking things that are. Uh, over the counter or, or what we termed traditional remedies because some traditional remedies can be uh, hepatotoxic um, and so we do have to be a little bit careful with some but actually the traditional multivitamin that you can buy from Holland and Barrett or Boots or whatever um, mm -hmm. is is generally extremely safe. In terms of what would the vitamins you would particularly need if you have PVC the biggest one really is is vitamin D um, mm -hmm. and I think um, it's important to remember that uh, NICE, which is one of the regulatory bodies, recommends that uh, all of us living in the UK should be taking vitamin D in the winter uh, mm. because we, we produce vitamin D from our access to sunlight. So I know up in Scotland you get even less than we do in Wales. <laughs> um, and, and so it can be quite important, certainly through the winter months. And if you have, if you are naturally very dark skinned, um, then, then some people need to take that in, in the summer as well. So a bit of additional vitamin D doesn't do any harm. There's actually been a bit of interesting work around whether vitamin D deficiency makes you more likely to have severe COVID, interestingly enough. And that might be one of the reasons why people from Southeast Asia and India and Pakistan seem to suffer from COVID in a, in a more severe fashion. It's not completely fully explored, but certainly having a low vitamin D isn't generally very good for you, either your immune system uh, and nor is it very good for your bones. So the main the main importance of having lots of vitamin D in in in, in your diet, uh, you know, um, in your system is so that your bones are healthy because we know that people with PVC can suffer from thinning of the bones and even frank osteoporosis and early onset fractures. Mm -hmm. So yeah, multivitamins are fine as long as they're from a reputable uh, source. Um, but the, the main thing is just think about your vitamin D. Do, do, is this something the hematologist check when the patient comes in or do you feel that it's on yeah. the patient to, to ask? It's a really good question about vitamin D assessment. I, I think we probably don't do it as often as perhaps we should. I think the NICE mm -hmm. recommendation is still a relatively recent one within the last five to ten years. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think we know that the risk of having osteoporosis, um, so that's you know the most severe mm -hmm. form of thin bones, um, is increased in PVC if you have jaundice or if you have cirrhosis. Mm -hmm. If you haven't got jaundice and cirrhosis and you've got a good calcium intake in your diet, and you undertake regular weight bearing exercise, coming back to that movement and medicine thing again, Colette, how important that is um, for, for your general health and well being, um, is, is that actually the risk of osteoporosis is relatively low if you don't have cirrhosis and you don't have jaundice. But, uh, but I think at the same time, it's, it's good health, health advice to be taking plenty of calcium in your diet, um, get, get out into the sunshine as much as you possibly can, and in the winter months, taking some vitamin D supplementation won't do you any harm. Mm. And check, I think it's worth saying to people to check the diet because you, I think most of us, um, if if not all, get a DEXA, a DEXA scan every 10 years or so. Uh, five years or 10 years. That's five years, I think. And uh, it checks your bone mass. But this time, they're now giving out quite lengthy questionnaires before your DEXA scan. And yeah, I even I was quite surprised that in my diet, I didn't have enough uh, calcium. Yeah. Um, because I don't like milk and that kind of thing. So now I have a bit of yogurt, but she said even an extra slice of bread. But I wrongly thought what you ate as a child set the way your bones were going to be. And it didn't really matter, but she said it absolutely does matter, your ongoing diet and keeping your calcium topped up. So you raise a, a valid issue there. Don't uh, assume, you know, all the good stuff has all happened. We still have to keep topping it up, don't we? Yes, you know, cal regular calcium intake is the single most important thing you can do, as well as supplements and vitamin D um, in the winter months. So I think, yeah, it's absolutely essential because your body needs the calcium all the time. So if you've yeah. got a low calcium intake, mm -hmm. it's certainly worth increasing it. It doesn't have to be milk, as you say. Mm -hmm. Other dairy products will be high in calcium. And as I say, breakfast cereals, uh, bread will also contain calcium as well. Um, as, as an additional supplemental source. So there's lots of ways of getting additional calcium into your diet if you don't like uh, uh, yeah. traditional milk or you've got lactose intolerance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So somebody's saying they have AFib, art, atrial fibrillation. Now, I'm not good at medical words. 
and I have been prescribed a blood thinner. Will this affect my PBC? No, no, there's there's no suggestion that will be harmful to your PBC at all. Um, so I think PBC is not what we call a, a vascular disorder. It's not due to blood supply issues and, and blood thinners will neither make it better, but nor will they make it any worse. The, the medications, typically people are on warfarin, but there's other uh, tablet medications that sometimes people take for um, to thin the blood when you have atrial fibrillation, uh, that they're all extremely safe. Um, mm -hmm. In, in in liver diseases. Some of the newer uh, blood thinners you have to be a little bit cautious of when you have the most advanced form of liver disease, mm -hmm. what we call decompensated cirrhosis. So that's where you've developed ascites or hepatic encephalopathy with, with quite um, significant cirrhosis. But for the vast, vast majority of patients, um, even the newer ones are safe and, and warfarin, as long as it's closely monitored, uh, is the appropriate treatment if you have atrial fibrillation. So yeah, I wouldn't I wouldn't have any concern about being on atrial fibrillation in terms of the impact on your PBC because it shouldn't have any. Yeah, is it also fair to say, I mean, people with PBC, we get other things, don't we? We get loads of other things, you know, thyroid disease, you know, AFIB or whatever. And I suppose the, the consultant you know, who's came for you has to take a balanced view as to what is safe, you know, what might need closer monitoring if you had a particular medication. I mean, it's... It's, I suppose in some people it can be quite complicated, but it's about risk and benefit really at the end of the day, isn't it, Andrew? It is. And I think the other thing to say is that we, we mustn't neglect our pharmacy colleagues in this. They have a fantastic, mm -hmm. they play an enormous role in the NHS yeah. and in healthcare generally. Mm -hmm. And so whenever a, a doctor prescribes a medication, um, then you normally take along or the pharmacist normally ask you what other medications you're taking and they will do that. That's an extra safety check, if you like. Yeah. So you get an expert in all the different complex interactions that can occur uh, mm -hmm. to sort of make sure that all your medications are, are safe and above board. So there's there's a mm -hmm. couple of different safety checks in the system, really, to make sure that that medication is A, appropriate for you, mm -hmm. and B, doesn't interact with other existing conditions or other medications that you might be taking. Yeah, it is a good point. I think chemists, pharmacists are maybe underused in boots and, they, you know, the ones out in the shopping centres. They are highly qualified people. Yeah. And uh, so please don't hesitate. You can make the appointments with them if you want a one-on-one -on -one or they'll speak to you at the end of the counter. But it's very, very worthwhile checking with them too. They know what they're talking about. If they don't know, they know where to get the information, that's for sure. They so there's a very good yeah, there's a very good question here, and we get asked this a lot. Um, and maybe you can do your medical bit, and I'll do a wee bit uh, on this as well, Andrew. One of my relatives has PVC. I'm 39 years of age. I keep well. I'm not showing any signs or symptoms. Should I be tested for PVC as a precaution? Yeah, it's it's it's, it's always a good question, isn't it? And I think we we don't have the evidence. In all honesty, um, I think you know the the probability of you having PBC just because you've got a relative with it is still very, very low. So it's still mm -hmm. far, far more likely that you won't have it than you will. Um, so if you don't have any symptoms, then it's not currently, uh, you know, um, evidence-based that, that, that you have to get tested for PBC. Um, I think it, in general, I think it's not an unreason, you know, if you have symptoms, certainly you need to get check any itching or, or unexplained or excessive fatigue for, for certain, but, um, but certainly, if, if there's a if there's significant doubt, I think if you also have another autoimmune disease yourself, um, I think sort of just having a liver blood test is just you know it's it's relatively straightforward to get done, and then the GPs will often do that. But it's not particularly evidence based because the, the probability isn't that high. But if there's a, if there's a concern and anxiety around it, then then the simple liver blood test, looking for the alkaline phosphate is because if that's not elevated, we wouldn't rush to go on and doing. Uh, mm -hmm. the antibody testing etc cetera, etc cetera. so so i think it's it's not it's not a mandatory thing that that we test all first degree relatives of people who have pbc so we don't go mm -hmm. searching for it because the, the vast majority of people and and relatives with somebody with pbc won't have it themselves but um if there's a particular concern yourself uh, in the absence of symptoms then a simple liver blood test and if, if the ALP is normal, then, then you almost certainly don't have it at this point in time. Yeah, I, I, this is a very, very important question because in the big liver centres, you know, where Andrew works and, and many of the guests on these uh, Thursday slots know what order to do things. But what I've seen happen historically 
is quite rightly you're concerned about your relatives, particularly if you have daughters, I think. I mean, I've got sons, but um, they're a nuisance in their own way, I have to tell you. But seriously, and so what's happened, Andrew, historically, is that a doctor has gone looking for the AMA, mm. and when, the, the, in some instances, found the AMA, and although their liver function is normal, mm. these people were unable to get insurance. They were stuck for mortgages. Mm. It caused those kind of problems. And on top of that, they were living with the psychological, emotional fear, looking for symptoms, et cetera. So it's, 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 it's quite complex. And, and I'm pleased to hear you say, Andrew, that they would now look, for, uh, look at the ALP. Because if that's normal, end of story. So I think maybe it's, it's something worth writing about in the newsletter because if you go looking for the, the antibody, it's there. But you may never develop PBC, but it can cause you all sorts of other problems that you actually just don't need in life. What do you, th what do you think, Andrew? Is it worth writing about this? I think it is, yeah. I mean, I think it's the reason it's a grey area, and this, of, this often sounds very strange when you speak to people about this and say, well, why wouldn't you look for something if finding it earlier might be helpful? And the reason for that, and, and this is the same thing argument that applies to all sort of cancer screening programs as well, is that sometimes you can cause people harm by looking for things when they're not there. Yeah. Um, and if the probability of that thing is is actually low risk, and you know, in the absence of symptoms, the risk becomes lower, um, then, as I said, you can end up um, engendering emotional harm sometimes, to, not so much with PBC, but in the olden days when we used to do biopsies, that could potentially cause harm to somebody, couldn't it, you know? Um, and, and so, and then there's the emotional distress, and then there's the practicality aspect of sometimes it can affect life insurance, et cetera, et cetera. It shouldn't do, but, but, but you know, a lot of insurance companies will just give, give you a blanket no. So, so it can create a lot of additional problems. And so it's that tension between trying to pick up conditions where they might be at an early, early time point and not optimal for treatment, whilst at the same time not in engendering additional um, yeah. emotional or, or physical distress. So um, coming back to the ALP again, as, you, as you've rightly pointed out, Colette, is that you can have a positive AMA, but if your ALP is normal, we don't regard people as having PVC at this point in time. Yeah. That might change in the future if we have some other fancy tests to be able to determine yeah. very early PVC. Mm -hmm. But if your ALP is normal, we would not put people on medication as things stand at the moment. And we wouldn't give people a diagnostic label of, of PBC uh, with a normal ALP. So it's the ALP is far more useful. And it's an easy test to do. Primary care doctors are very familiar with requesting uh, liver function tests. Yeah. And even though it's not st strictly speaking directly indicated, usually if you have a chat to GP, say, like, I'm just a bit worried that, that this yeah. could be something for me. They'll, yeah. normally do a, they'll normally do a simple liver blood test panel for you. And if that is normal, I would put it to the back of your mind. Yeah, but if, if there's any sign of any symptoms, then absolutely, particularly I think the itch and the fatigue, the call, you know, the call fatigue is a symptom, but fatigue, lethargy, tiredness, heaviness, there's lots of words to describe something that's very difficult to describe. Mm. But if you're feeling anything, any symptoms, then absolutely. But don't hesitate to phone in and we can have a chat about it. And if need be, we can bring another question to the table. I think it's good. Yeah. Um, to get uh, knowledge on these things. So our uh, next question, a wee bit of background here. Diagnosis with PBC I started taking are so mid-October, so I take it's just recent. I've had a bad bout of biliary colic due to gallstones in November. Oh, poor thing. Had my three-month blood check, and it looks like my GGT has come back into, into range. GGT was 3-11 October, now 64. Okay. Is it something to be concerned about? Am I a non or partial responder or is it easy, too early to tell? And how long does it normally take for your results to come back? Okay, okay. so there's quite a lot in there, isn't there? Okay, so um, first of all, if you're having recurrent problems with biliary colic from stones in your gallbladder, because that's what biliary colic is, then um, unless you've got lots of other health problems that would mean an operation would be very high risk. It's generally a advisable thing to do to get your gall gallbladder removed. Okay. Once it, you know, we always say if you find stones on a scan incidentally, don't bother the gallbladder unless it's bothering you. But if it starts to bother you, it's nearly always advisable to get the gallbladder taken out because you will tend to suffer from problems, maybe periodically, but they will tend to come on over time and you'll get bursts of quite unpleasant pain. And sometimes, you know, if they get stuck in the pancreatic duct, you can get pancreatitis and, and that can be even more nasty. 
Um, and sometimes you can get a stone stuck in the ballot and you can become jaundiced from it and have to have an ERCP, uh, which is an endoscopic procedure. So if you're having recurrent problems with gallstones, please get it looked at and, and you know, ideally get, in, get yourself in front of a surgeon via your GP or your hepatologist to have a discussion about having your gallbladder removed. In many people, it's done as a day case operation these days or people are in uh, the following day. So it's it's. Nothing's no risk, but it's you know it's it's a very common operation that has a very uh, quick recovery from. So please get you know I would advise anybody who's having problems with that to get it sorted out. In terms of the gamma GT, a low gamma GT is an enzyme that often mirrors the ALP in terms of it. In other words, it's related to problems of the bile duct. The gamma GT can go up in people who don't have problems with the bile duct as well. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not something that we use as part of what we call our response criteria for PBC. So we would not, when we are assessing your response to ERSO uh, treatment or whether you're on a beta-colic acid as well, the gamma GT is not part of that panel of assessments. So that wouldn't be useful in determining whether you're a responder or not. Mm -hmm. We don't officially call somebody a non-responder of ERSO until they've not responded at 12 months. Okay, so that's an important thing to remember. Although, generally speaking, 90% of the improvement will occur within the first six months. You kind of get a bit of an inkling at six months whether people are responding. And some people will actually respond quicker than 12 months, sometimes quicker than six months. Um, but certainly, 12 months is the optimal time point to check whether you're a, a responder to your medication. Um, and so um, it's, it might be a little bit early for that for you. And we wouldn't use Gamma GT for that purpose. There was a third part of the question, wasn't there, Colette? And the third part was in relation to... It's, it's, I'm passionate about it. And how long does it take normally for your results blood. to come yeah. back? So um, liver blood results are, depending if you haven't done as an outpatient, they will normally be processed um, that day or the following day um, because they don't have to be done instantaneously. And then the result, if it's from primary care so or community clinic, then... Um, because they're considered non-urgent results, because they're not inpatient results, then they will go back to the doctor within one to two days. So blood results are virtually always available within three or four days. Um, and then it's a matter of just, you know, if a, if a letter's had to go back to the GP, for example, and it goes through the post, that might be a few more days. But certainly if, if you're talking about a week, 10 days, the blood results will always be available. It's then a, a matter, I suppose, of, of whether the, uh, the, the doctor at that end um, uh, you know how busy they are with other things in terms of um, whether they've been redeployed or etc etc but you know that that might engender a little bit of delay but certainly the blood results will be back within several days. Yeah and I think it's worth saying as well I am going back to the point about the GTT because they looked at the GTT in the old days in the old yeah. days and um, just so as you know I've been diagnosed with PBC <clears throat> 28 years this month Right, so I come from the very old days and your GTT was very important. But to this person, you could ask about your ALP, your alkaline phosphatase. I think you did mention that, didn't you? Yeah. So that's what they'd be looking at. And they also look at trends, remember, they won't look at one uh, set of uh, blood tests. Um, they always look at trends. But the other thing I want to say, and, and, this to, and, I, and I, I'm going to stress to everybody again, I'm not a doctor and I wouldn't pretend to be a doctor, but I just pick up little things. And, you know, we've had some um, gruelling times these last two years, all of us, whether it be professionally, personally, everything else to do with COVID. And we've had to adopt and adapt to different lifestyles. And with that, people have gained a bit of weight, maybe eaten a bit more, maybe not exercised as much. You know, we've had a lot to deal with. And sometimes, you know, I've heard doctors talk about a raised GTT, and sometimes that can be to do with your weight, um, as well. So if you feel you're putting on weight and nobody's judging you, God, I'm the last person to judge you. But bear that in mind as well, that that's something you could discuss with your doctor if there's any weight, weight things going on. Um, it's it's We are having difficult times, as Andrew says. I hope we're coming out of them. But is that fair to comment on that? Andrew? Yeah, no, I think, as I said, I alluded earlier, didn't I, that yeah. gamma GT goes up for other reasons not related to your yeah. liver and, and weight yeah. gain is one of those. Alcohol consumption is another uh, people with diabetes often have an elevated gamma GT as well. Oh, so yeah, it goes yeah. up for lots of different reasons. The other important thing to remember about weight gain as well, however, is that um, the optimal dose of ERSO in, in PBC is weight-based. And so mm -hmm. if, if you've gained weight and your liver tests are not uh, in the response criteria, then you might need a slightly higher dose if you've gained weight since you were started on the medication. Yeah, 
we're about to launch. You're going to be, every single one of you are going to receive one of these. What do you think of that, Andrew? Isn't that just marvelous? That's brilliant. That's exactly. Oh, that was almost like that was almost set up, wasn't it, Colette? It almost was, yeah. In the old days, your doctor weighs you, and I got to the point. I was putting on so much weight. I went to clinic and I said, "No, don't bother." But this, these, this weight chart's an imperial for old people like me and metric for youngsters like young Andrew here, and it tells you what what you what dose you should be taking. Now I've just lost over three stones, so I'm going to drop mine. I am equally I had to take more when I put on the weight. So this is going to every single one of you will have one of these and we'll have it on your website. So don't always rely on your doctor. Do it yourself. Take a wee bit charge of that. And nobody's blaming you for doing different things during COVID. These are tough times for everybody. Um, so we've just got to get ourselves through it. But hopefully this will help you. I gave one of this to my consultant yesterday. He said, but I knew all this. I said, yeah, that's a wee reminder. I'll send you one down, Andrew, OK? Lovely, thank you. <laughs> And, and for those uh, patients who are not getting to see their doctors, maybe through choice because you don't feel you want to go to a hospital, you'd rather speak to your doctor on the phone, um, or for those that are having more difficulties in the, uh, for other reasons. So you will have this there. So take charge of that. It's dead simple. If you're in doubt, give us a ring. Um, okay, I have dry eyes and dry mouth, itching ears, which is sometimes very painful. I've been told this could be sugars, which I'm still being investigated for. Can the itching in the ears and pain be caused by PPC? Um, pain certainly can be counted. I mean, I think, you know, uh, pain with associated uh, conditions like Sjogren's um, and a lot of people with PPC get muscle pain as well, don't they, Colette? I mean, I think yeah. one thing that was really striking yeah. out of that word cloud you developed from the app mm -hmm. um, was just how prominent pain was as a feature. In fact, more more prominent in the word cloud than, than itch. Um, for people who are not familiar with word clouds, it's where you take uh, a, group, a lot of data with, with lots of text in it and then you put it in, into, a, um, into words, in, in, for a better phrase, and the more common that word appears, the bigger it appears on the, on the diagram, on the word cloud. And, and pain really, really struck out, didn't it, in, the, in that analysis. And I think it wasn't a complete shock, but I think what was a surprise was just how prominent it was. Yeah. Uh, and so, yes, pain absolutely... Um, not just of the joints, which is more typical of the sort of Sjogren's or associated arth arthritis right. conditions, but muscle pain as well is is very, very common in PBC. Mm -hmm. um, itchiness of the ears, I mean, it, it could be related to that in terms of um, some people do get uh, skin conditions. Um, if it's if it's a, a lot of itchiness of the ears um, with, um, with crusting, that could be something called otitis externa. Um, it could be eczema. There's lots of simple things that that might be uh, treatable with simple drops. So it's worthwhile having, having a check of that with your GP because it might be something that's not directly related and it might be something that is easily treatable. So it's worthwhile if you're having problems with your, with, with, around the ear canal uh, just to get that checked over and to make sure it's not something that's easily treatable as a simple skin condition that's not directly related. Um, so, so we, yeah, we know PBC has lots of effects um, in terms of your symptomatology. And some of those are related to associated conditions, but some of them are directly uh, attributable to your PBC. Yeah. And I would also go, they, they have mentioned Sjogren's. So I'm just going to say this very briefly. Lots and lots of us have Sjogren's. Many people, uh, it turns the, neg the test is negative, but that doesn't mean to say you don't have your dry eyes and your dry mouth. We don't know why that happens. But if you're having dry eyes, dry mouth, don't hesitate. I don't have them there. I normally have eye drops. Get eye drops, keep your eyes uh, nice and wet as often as you need. Waterproof mascara for those that use it. Yeah. And um, and with your mouth, this is really, really important. Um, don't be using chemical mouthwashes, things like Corsidol and all the rest of it. And if they sue me, I'm fine with that. And dentists have, have come in here and they've explained that the chemicals can make your mouth even drier. Um, they tarnish your teeth and they change the taste of food and all sorts. So, you know, good old salt and water, Granny's warm water and salt is a good cleanser. Um, and ask your dentist to help you out with things that can bring some saliva into your mouth. But just because they say you haven't got Sjogren's, it doesn't show up in the test. It, you, you Please do treat the symptoms because um, it's important for your eye and your mouth health. Is that, is that for you, Andrew? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, mean, I think um, in terms of uh, treatment of dry mouth, um, as I said, there's no there's no magical sort of tricks that um, doctors have up their sleeves for it. It's, it's really just to try and stimulate salivary flow. Um, 
vitamin C. So, so, so fruits are very good, particularly those are, so that's, you know, oranges, tangerines, that sort of thing can stimulate um, uh, salivary flow, but obviously you can't be eating oranges all day, every day. Uh, but there are, there are sort of artificial uh, saliva solutions that you can get that are sprays to sort of moisten yeah. the mouth to facilitate eating and drinking. Yeah. Um, and I think th those can be those can be very very effective for some people. And I say dentists will often advise on those things, won't yeah. they? Yeah, um, they, they absolutely but, will. Yeah. But they can they can be really really helpful at trying yeah. to minimise that unpleasant sensation of of dry mouth for dry mm -hmm. eye, dry eyes. Then then yeah. simple viscous tears, which are basically just yeah. effectively artificial tears, are are very effective to stop that grittiness, which can be really quite unpleasant. Yeah, and, and and go for an oil based tier, but your optician or your chemist or your chemist again will keep you right. Now, I've got a question here. If I can see a couple of things first, I'm going to hand over to you, uh, um, if I may, Andrew. I was diagnosed 18 months ago and I have gastric pains and aches over the last few months that kind of go okay. Can you give me advice and tips on diet and what to avoid? I'm happy to speak with you on the phone, but what I will to say to you, we've all got varied tastes and everything else, and um, we you know what we like and what we don't like just be careful with sugar you know there's carbohydrates refined and complex complex carbohydrates they're they're very good for you and they've got a function watch it with the sugars and hidden sugars if something says low fat it might have more refined sugar in it check it out but sugar in itself i think is one of the most awful things on this planet it's addictive it's just not good for you it gives you a wee spike and then drains your energy just for diet purposes a bit of everything and a bit of what you fancy. If that means a, a biscuit with a cup of tea at night, or if that means a wee half glass of wine, then do it. It's the excesses that's the problem. It's good. just keep it balanced, good vegetables. Don't overdo it on the pineapples and everything because they can be quite sugary. But I'm happy to talk you talk you through on the phone and you'll have your own likes and dislikes. But just watch it with refined carbohydrates and processed yeah. foods as well. You know, if you're hungry, go to your kitchen. Don't, you know, pick up the phone and get a pizza. It, it just, it's not good. It's habitual. It, it's addictive. It's not good. Can I come in on that? I, I would completely yes, wholeheartedly please. agree with all of that, Colette. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of the specific uh, um, query that was raised, I mean, I think um, the person mentioned they were suffering a lot with abdominal That's pain. Good. Gastric pains, yeah, and actually, in. gastric pains actually are, are not considered a direct consequence of PBC by and large, and but they're very common in the general population. Mm -hmm. So, um, if you look, just for example, I'm not saying your yours is related to IBS, but IBS affects up to forty percent of the population at some point in their life. So, in other words, gut symptoms are phenomenally common, yeah. and they're often due to either hyperacidity, and that can often be triggered by what we're eating. Um, and the other common thing that will give you gastric pains is a poor bowel function. That's colonic function. So being a little bit constipated and that can be exacerbated if you have PBC by limited movement or any painkillers you're taking for arthritis or, or joint pains, for example. So, fluids. <laughs> absolutely. So think about your diet in that sense and avoiding um, high fat, high sugar things, which can exacerbate both acid reflux type problems, which can give you gastric pains. And also think about your general gut health and gut function. Um, okay. Are you going to the toilet adequately? Um, are you strained to, to go to the toilet? All those things, can, are you bloating? Those are things that are a sign of slightly sluggish bowel function. And okay. better hydration can help with that. Lower fat diets can help with that. More fiber in your diet can help. That will help with your cholesterol as well, which is also very, very good. Movement okay. as medicine once again. Getting, you know, getting moving a little bit more. Actually, one of the most important things to stimulate healthy bowel function is regular physical activity. So mm. if, if you take young people and stick them in bed for a week, they'll all get constipated. Okay, seriously. They did They did it with Swedish medical students back in the 60s. They stuck them all in bed and they all got horrendously constipated. So so if, you, if you're not moving around or if you're suffering from arthritis pain, all those things will will uh, will limit your bowel function. So, so think about, you know, your PVC is important, but think that many of the things that will happen to you and other symptoms you will get will not be directly related to your PBC. They will be related to things that are common in the general population. And bowel conditions and gastric conditions are extraordinarily common in the general population. And so think about those things about your diet. Think about your hydration. Think about your physical activity. And those little things that can all make a small difference in terms of your general health and well-being. 
yeah, absolutely. You've got a, you you make very very valid points there, and most of us has, have learned from trial and error. I can tell you. But if you want to read about gut health, Dr. Michael Mosley, whom I've actually met, you know the chap I mean, who does a lot about gut health and type two diabetes. He's got some good books out, and you can always email him and ask questions. Yeah. Right, we need to fire on. They're coming. The questions are coming in fast and furious. I've been asked if I'd like to start a, take part in a clinical trial called RUDEX. It's R H U D E X. It is second stage trial as my PBC has not been managed effectively with Urso. Is there anyone else on this or have any knowledge of it? RUDEX? RUDEX. Which, which part of the world are these people? Are they in the US? I don't know. I, I don't know if this person's listening. Do you want to give me a wee bit more information? Um, and then we'll come back to that. If the person, I'm sure they'll be listening, give us a wee bit more information. If we miss it today, we'll get it ne next Thursday, okay? Rude Rudex is not a, a, a brand name I'm, I'm familiar no, with. And well, maybe Chris um, is in the background. You can look it up for me. No, I mean, certainly there, there, you know, there are phase two trials that have gone on for Sidalapar and Elafibronol um, that have shown promise, that are moving yeah. into other studies. Um, mm. I think... Um, as I said, you know, I'd be happy to uh, comment further if, 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 if just write like the, what the drug name is, yeah, because yeah. Rudex will be uh, that. That's an abbreviation, if you like. That's what we call a brand name. Right. Okay. Um, so it, the it's, not, it's, it's not a com common drug brand name in the UK. So, so yeah. the actual drug name is is what we need to be able to tell you what that okay. is. Right. Whenever you're approached about a clinical trial, you should be given a whole raft of information, which explains what the drug is what it's been how it's been studied before whether it's been studied in other conditions so in other words is this new in humans or is it being extrapolated from other uh, health conditions for example there should be a list of an anticipated or known side effects within that there yeah. should be a description about how how it might benefit you from a pbc point of view um and, and then there, there will always be somebody then you should be able to go back to and ask further questions from the trial team mm -hmm. if those things are not offered that's not an appropriate trial yeah. setup so yeah. all those things need to be in place yeah. Um, but if you let us know the, 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 the actual yeah. drug name, I'm sure we can comment further from that. Okay, brilliant. And trials, by the way, we always encourage people. Like, Absolutely. If it's not right for everybody, if, if you feel you'd like to help out, please do. You know, even taking part in our questionnaires, we're hammering our members with questionnaires, um, Andrew, and we love it when you reply. We need lots and lots and lots of answers. Yes. You know, you have those answers. You need to give them to us. And it, But it's great. But trials, we, we do encourage people. Okay, I'm going to bang on. I'm going to talk very quickly now. I've, <laughs> I've itching across my waist, under my armpits, and down the sides of my body. My uncles, my ankles are also sometimes swell and itch. As far as I'm aware, I do not have a liver problem. But I have read itching as a symptom of PBC. I had blood tests a month ago, which showed everything normal. Should I be concerned and I and have further tests? Um, but based on itching, I think um, things with the it itching is that um, if you have itching and you've already got a known diagnosis of PBC, uh, that 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 doesn't always mean that the PBC has got worse. We know mm -hmm. the itching fluctuates and is independent of the severity of your PBC. So don't be alarmed that that means your PBC is definitely worsening, but it does always warrant a check um, and a review. So I think I would always say that if you've got itching from PBC and it's not settling with the simple treatments, then you do need a review with your uh, healthcare team because there are other treatments that we need to start or you need to be considered um, to see if that can improve your symptoms. I'm not uh, sure this person's can... got PBC. I, I think, but, I mean, itching's a known um, symptom for all of her diseases, yeah. so maybe she needs to go back yeah. and have the whole gamut. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah. so yes. So if, if you're not known to have PBC, first of all, you need a test to make certain you don't have it. Uh, but as Colette says, um, P, uh, itching is, although it's, it's more common in PBC than in lots of other liver diseases, it can be seen in any chronic liver disease yeah. uh, and interestingly we see it quite a lot in fatty liver disease in the fatty liver trials we've seen you know even without cirrhosis we've seen a lot of itching when you ask people the question you, yeah. you sometimes get results that perhaps initially surprise you so yes itching can be and it can be it doesn't have to be related to liver disease either there are skin yeah. conditions that can be associated with itching so if you don't have a diagnosis see your gp as the first point of call they can do some simple blood tests to see if you have some abnormal liver blood tests 
They can check your skin over to see if there's any other skin conditions. Other common things, if you just got itching without a known liver disease diagnosis, is think about what other things you're using in your home environment. Any new detergents, powders, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, anything new that's in your household environment that could be triggering itching, because uh, it's often a cutaneous reaction from something in your home environment. Um, so, so you know, there's all sorts of manner of things to consider. But if it's really troublesome then your GP would be a good first point of call. Yeah, or a dermatologist, what have you. But on that, the home environment, what you're saying, you're absolutely quite right. And I know this happened to me many years ago. And I couldn't figure this out. And there was nothing medically different. And it was my friend who's a virologist. And she said, there must be something. That says, well, I've got a new face cream. There was an anti-wrinkle cream. And there was um, antifreeze, apparently. And then I wouldn't recognise uh -huh. I wouldn't recognise uh, what was on the label, and I stopped it, and I was fine. So sometimes you don't know what you're taking. I'm going to hammer on. Right, on the screen now, we've got Margaret. Margaret says, are there any antibiotics that should be avoided? Um, any antibiotics? So not really, no. I mean, so, mm. so like, if you look at the package insert of, of virtually any medication you can take, many of them will say it you know, can cause liver test abnormalities. Yeah. Um, so... Actually, I wouldn't say there's any particular one that you need to avoid. Obviously, if you have no allergy to anything, then please avoid that one. Um, but but certainly, while some antibiotics cause um, liver reactions more commonly than others, mm -hmm. um, having PVC doesn't make you more likely to have a drug reaction. So yeah. if your doctor thinks you need a particular antibiotic for a urinary tract yeah. infection or a chest infection or whatever it happens to be, then... Mm -hmm. Then we would we'd advise you to take that, and it, you know there's there's no increased risk of having a, a drug reaction because Trust you already have PBC. Trust your doctor. There's a really funny story. There's an antibiotic it used to be called Flagyl. What's it called now, Andrew? Uh, it's metronidazole. Okay, I can't say that. So now Flagyl, they tell you absolutely never go anywhere near alcohol if you yes. take Flagyl, it'll make you very very sick. So there was the beginnings of something called antibuse. From that knowledge, they created antibuse, which is given to people who have alcohol problems and to try and stop them drinking. So anyway, it's a nice wee story for you. Right, good morning, Colette. Oh, it's Mona in the States, Dr. Yeoman, and everyone from ah, Louisiana. Louisiana, thank you for being there today. Oh, and there's no question, you're welcome, Mona. It's lovely that you're in. Hilary, I'm feeling very fed up with continued weight gain, feeling bloated since starting our story yesterday, last year. It's seriously affected my morale. Of course it is. At times, I would prefer to stop taking the medication and take my chances and see my consultant every year for a checkup. I know what she means. This happens to some people, but there are yes. ways of dealing with it. I was unfortunately one of those people. It was in the days where they, they said there was no correlation, but some doctors will say there is. That it's. I, I think it's a shame, isn't it? Yeah, I think we don't truly really know what the mechanism is, but certainly some people certainly do put on weight on her. So mm -hmm. it does seem to be worse in the first six to twelve months of treatment. Yeah. yeah. Um yeah. and it does seem to um balance off thereafter. So if you're relatively early into treatment, it may well calm, you know, settle down and you might not gain any further mm -hmm. weight. Mm -hmm. Um the other thing with weight gain is as Colette kind of alluded to as well, is that it's quite a non-specific thing and it can occur for lots of different reasons as well. So sometimes when people are diagnosed with PBC and put onto treatment, there's other things happening as well. As I say, if you're suffering from arthritis or suffering from profound fatigue and you're uh, less active, understandably because of that, and that will also promote weight gain. So th there's lots of different things. So um, ultimately it will come down though. So if you've, if you've tried some simple things to try and offset weight gain, um, and um, it definitely started after the medication. It, it's it, it's worth a conversation with your healthcare team, you know, mm -hmm. whether that's your GP or your, or your hospital team, because depending on the stage of your disease, there may be some other options that can be that can be used either to help you manage the weight gain, but also um, in terms of alternative therapies if that really is causing significant problems. So I, I would certainly, Hilary, recommend you have a, a conversation with your healthcare team but if, if it's relatively early on after starting you know, so then, then it does tend to calm down it does and it's also worth saying there's lots and lots of genetic companies making or so now now the, yeah. the component is in the same and the capsules all the same but the cat and the chemist explained this to me the capsules are all made of different uh, substances so it could well be you just need a change of our so the, the, the one that's licensed and seems to work better for most people comes from Dr. Falk that's, yeah. I've got a box there actually. There you are. 
So I don't know if you're using that, but you could ask to change on to that, which seems to, to work better for a lot of people. So that's worth um, trying as well. But any, any problem, just give me a wee ring and we can have a chat. Yeah. Right, so Mona's saying, hyperthyroid, does, does PBC have a part in this? Now, that's a broad question. I mean, we're going to be very quick here, Mona, but hypothyroid, the hypothyroidism, does it, PBC have a part in this? Uh well, yes, in the sense that PBC is an autoimmune condition and hyperparathyroidism is also an autoimmune condition. So, so they are both um, what we call manifestations of um, autoimmunity. So in other words, your immune system doesn't like you um, and it attacks various parts of you. So in PBC, that, that attacks the bile ducts within the liver. If it's um, hyperparathyroidism, it tickles up the parathyroid glands, which are tiny, tiny little pea-like glands either side of your thyroid in the neck, and you've usually got four of them, and then that can stimulate those glands to produce more parathyroid hormone, which will put your calcium levels up. Mm. Um, so, so yes, they are both autoimmune conditions. So PBC doesn't so much cause it, but they are both um, expressions, if you like, manifestations of the fact that you have an immune system that's a little bit wonky, um, and, it, and it misbehaves and reacts against some of your tissues, and then the hyperparathyroidism and the high calcium is a consequence of that reaction. Yeah, yeah. Now, this poor soul, Sarah, I've told the ligands of my foot out. I've been told to use ibuprofen as painkillers from the Mind Energies Unit. There's a question, actually, I've got on my tablet here uh, with ibuprofen. Uh, however, I have stage 2 3 PVC with some liver scan. Is this okay to take on a temporary basis? Ibuprofen is part of, I think, anti inflammatories and we, we know we have to be really, really careful. Um, I'm going to let Andrew take that over. Yeah, so I think in, in general, I think that the risk factors for having lots of bad side effects from anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen or, or Voltarol, diclofenac, are if you have cirrhosis, then we usually advise people to avoid. And certainly if you have any, ever had um, complications of cirrhosis like ascites or bleeding, we would usually advise people to avoid. But if you have stage two to three PVC, then then you you don't have cirrhosis, and therefore short term use of non steroidals is generally okay. Mm -hmm. If you have any chronic kidney disease, you have to be careful though. Mm -hmm. And if you're over sixty five, then you certainly need to just use them for the shortest period possible because uh, those are the sorts of uh, risk factor groups where you're more likely to have significant upset of the of the gut, and you know these mm -hmm. drugs can cause quite nasty ulceration. And it could even cause nasty bleeding in some people. Yeah. But short term yeah. use, a couple of days um, yeah. in people without cirrhosis is generally more than acceptable. Mm -hmm. um, the other option you can have um, if they do tend to cause a bit of uh, tummy upset when you take them is you can get the topical treatments. Um, and those have a lower instance of gut side effects because you get more of the drug where you need it to rather than ingesting it by the gut. Okay. So it should be OK for you to take yeah. uh, on a temporary basis for several days. Yeah. Um, yeah, but certainly, if you get any tummy tummy discomfort, then uh, yeah. try the try the topical treatments. I, I tell everybody with PBC, I've got all these props here. You know, you know, this is not unusual. People know which car is mine because it's sitting there <laughs> next to the driver's seat. Um, Mark says, "Thank you." It was a discussion I had real bile ducts with one. I'm not quite sure that what it relates to. Margaret, come back and tell me what that is because we've fired through a lot of questions. Yeah. Um, Hilly says, "Thank you." Yaro Nurse Falk, okay. Um, you could try another one, or you could ask for the suspension, which is the liquid, and um, give it a bash. But let's have a chat, Hilary. We can talk that through because I, I do sympathise and I empathise with you. Now I'm going to come to my tab. I've got a whole load of uh, questions here that Linda has been hammering down the line to me. Uh, what about ibuprofen, which you've covered? You've covered yeah. well. Um. And so after that, I'm wondering about taking a blood thinner. Well, I think we've really, does it have an effect on the liver and cholesterol? My cholesterol is seven. Is it any different from someone who hasn't PBC and is a statin recommended? So she's saying, uh, I'm wondering about taking a blood thinner. Does yeah. it have an effect on the liver and cholesterol is seven? So um, blood thinners, we've discussed that, that they don't have an, an, an adverse effect on, on your liver. Some of the new blood thinners, you have to be a bit careful when you've got yeah. you know, the more advanced forms of liver disease, but your doctor would, would consider that, the pharmacist would pick that up also. In terms of your cholesterol, we know the cholesterol goes up in PBC, but it tends to start to be more high-density lipoprotein, which is the more good cholesterol rather than bad cholesterol. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you're if your bad cholesterol, which is your LDL, is high, and generally if your cholesterol is 7, it probably is, 
then you are going to need a statin most likely. So obviously only your doctor will know what proportions of good versus yeah. bad cholesterol you've got in there. But if your cholesterol is seven, the chances are you've got a fair amount of so-called bad cholesterol in there and and um, uh, statins are a good option for that. Let's mm -hmm. not forget, of course, that another good treatment for high cholesterols is fibrates, which also may have a beneficial effect in PBC. So mm -hmm. beta fibrate and phenofibrate, although they t tend to work more effectively on the triglycerides, which is another type of, mm -hmm. of fat in, in, in the system, um, they will also bring down your, your, your cholesterol as well. So there are several options to treat it. Yeah. Uh, and, and certainly that will need a discussion with your with your GP to do that. They'll be very familiar with managing that. There is no there is no reason why just because you have a liver condition that you can't take statins. That's a bit of a misnomer, okay? So um, statins are, statins are generally very very safe. Mm -hmm. And as James Newberger said to me the other day, if uh, you're on statins, I don't think you're allowed to take grapefruit. Is that right? Grapefruit. Yeah, yeah, some statins, uh, grapefruit affect the metabolism of yeah. Yeah. Um, I do experience bone pain, especially in my legs. Is this a feature of PBC or low vitamin D? Firstly, get your vitamin D checked anyway. Just get yes. that checked. Um, and what would you say about the bone pain in the legs? Um, you need a bone scan, don't you? I right. think I think if you've got PBC and you've got pains in your legs, mm -hmm. I think, and certainly if you haven't had a bone scan in, in the relatively recent past, you will need that. If, yeah. if you have and the bones are not excessively thin, you can still get pain. Um, mm -hmm. just from having a low vitamin D. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so um, vitamin D supplementation would, up and with, with some calcium as well, would be advised to improve that. So mm -hmm. certainly um, supplementation, calcium and vitamin D, and a and bone scan if you've not had one done recently to make sure there's no you know, excessive thinning of your bones for sure. Okay. Abby is asking, oh, Abby, I hear this a lot. Oh, Any yeah. Regarding cramps, legs, feet, hands, even my jaw, Tonic water, they say, is good, although I'm not a fan of it. Um, even their jaw, that, that is just awful, isn't it? Yeah. Do you know what? I, I would say cramps in chronic liver disease is one of the hardest things to treat of all. You know, it's on a par with trying to manage fatigue in PBC. You know, it's really, really difficult. Um, yeah. There's lots of different mechanisms. Um, I think certainly if people are on... Um, uh, diuretics, um, you know, which are water tablets to try and get you to get rid of extra fluid, then that, that can make cramps a bit more likely, but it's always important to make sure that you're well hydrated. So mm -hmm. if you're dehydrated, then that will increase your propensity to cramps. That's a good point, a good point, yeah. Um, so that, that's really, really important. Mm -hmm. um, I think, yes, quinine can help, I, either in tonic mm -hmm. water. Mm -hmm. Actually, you can only get relatively modest uh, concentrations yeah. of quinine into your system with tonic water. So it's okay to try to begin with. And if it works, great. If not, some people do need quinine sulfate uh, medications to try and to try and, uh, and help manage that. So it's a much more concentrated form of quinine. And, and that, that is always worth trying. Um, people have tried all sorts of different things from um, conditions for restless leg syndrome, which mm -hmm. are sort of muscle stabilizers for want yeah. of a better phrase. Um, None of them work particularly well, if, if I'm honest. I mean, I think we, we found very few things that are very, very effective mm -hmm. other than trying to make sure you're well hydrated and trying some quinine. So unfortunately, cramps is one of those big holes in our medical knowledge in terms of effective treatments. Um, mm -hmm. But but certainly, I think if, if you're struggling despite the traditional things, that then... Uh, then just get in touch with, with us i think it's probably best you know with your, your healthcare team and if that's me then just get in touch and we'll, we'll we'll scratch our heads and try some other little things but everything you can try beyond quinine is pretty much what we call off label in other words mm -hmm. it's it's not tested for that condition it's been yeah. extrapolated it's a little bit of a guess and it's a it's a trial and error so you have to do it cautiously with with yeah. medical input and supervision because um, you know the propensity to get some side effects is 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 quite high with some of these drugs, so it's yeah. it's just worth it worth a chat with your medical team if you've tried the simple stuff. So I can leave you in charge of this young lady then, um, Andrew. If, because she's your patient, I'm sure she is. <laughs> oh, he's gone! <laughs> oh, Abby, I'm really sorry. He's gone. He'll come back. He'll come back. <laughs> Right, somebody's while he's coming back, somebody's asking, is there a difference between the original or so and the generic? If our so has stopped working, would you mind trying the original, which I believe is our so fault? Why not? Absolutely, why not? It's more the case thing that can cause issues. 
uh, for some people, but why not? You have absolutely nothing to, to lose. Um, uh, so whoever asked that, I, I hope that answers your question. And I, I know that Andrew would say yes, because this has come up before. I'm just going to chat on and, until he comes back. Oh, bless him. Oh, poor Abby. <laughs> um, what makes the ALT rise? Mine has gone from 601 to 674, despite cutting out alcohol completely, eating healthy, lost 10 pounds. Good for you. Fantastic. And regular gym user uh, currently on our so okay we'll flip that to Andy if by any chance Andy can't get back I'm afraid we'll we'll have to hold on to these till next week um but I will make sure they get answered for you I'm in London diagnosed in December should I be seen by a gastro doctor a liver specialist if you if you can go to King's College or the Royal Free Royal Free is in the north King's College in, is in the south so if you're able to get to those two like one of those two liver units that would be ideal there will be specialists elsewhere but but let us know how you got on with those two hospitals I don't know if you're south London or north but they have they are specialist liver clinics and I would highly recommend those to you I'm going to keep uh, how can I deal with fatigue, please? It rules my life. Oh, bless you. I understand 100%. And the people behind the scenes here today will tell you what a green-faced, tone-faced woman I was with my fatigue. And I've been fatigued most of my life. And you're going to think I'm mad, but I'm going to tell you something. Movement is medicine. So when you're tired, and I know the tiredness is like walking in tar. It's, it's you know, my hair's long because blow-drying it is a, is a nuisance. And if it was shorter, I'd have to do it every day. You can help yourself absolutely by, um, you know, movement is medicine, whatever suits you, walking, a little bit of exercise, um, a good diet. But I would really quite like to speak to you because we can do things for fatigue. Um, but before, you know, I would like you to phone me and you'll get me through the office. Check out there's nothing else going on. Check out your thyroid is, is okay, that there's nothing else going on that could cause your fatigue. Um, and then we can look at how... Um, if you build up, and I'm not using the word exercise, it's not a particularly nice word, but movement is absolutely medicine. And if you can do a bit of something every day, whether that's walking up the stairs and down again, and then doing it half a, half a dozen times, or out to the gate and back, or a few lampposts, as I've seen people start off, because people have been so fatigued that they can't, that, you know, they can't get themselves about. So we can talk about that, but there are things you can do. I can't make it go away. But um, there are there are things we can do about it. So I hope you feel you've answered that question. But do phone me and we can talk um, through some more. Um, so the, the, somebody's come back. So Medigene is developing Rudex as a modifying agent for the treatment of autoimmune diseases. Now, I haven't heard about this. According to the firm, Rudex can bind to the CD80 protein. No, da, da, da. Right, OK, so it's quite complex. I'll fire this over to Andy. If he doesn't come back in today, and I'm not sure, I, I know he will be trying, he's, he's, he's a good lad, is Andy. But if Andrew can't get back in today, I will make sure this question is asked of a doctor next week. I don't know who we have on next week, but we will certainly keep that. And um, so Linda has sent a message saying, Rudex versus placebo and PBC on NHL's Health, uh, Health Research Authority. Contact name, Michael Stias, S-T-I-E-S-S, -S -S, sponsor, Dr. Falk, GB, GmbH. Uh, so I don't know, but I suspect. Ah, there we are, young man. Brilliant. I don't know. I don't know what happened there. I completely froze, so I had to log back out again. Sorry. Right, so I've answered a couple of questions myself because it yep. was movements, medicine, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I'll go back. So what... <laughs> <laughs> I have to... that scared you off yeah no you haven't scared me off Abby uh, <laughs> so um, no uh, just looking at the chat bar stuff yeah I mean so one of the things we we would check would be things like magnesium calcium levels etc check for some simple things um yeah. and so um I, I think it's worthwhile we're, we're, you know it's always worthwhile getting those um extra sort of macronutrients checked um there's a couple of sort of oral sort of amino acid supplements. There's one called tyrene, sometimes helps some people. So um, it's very much sort of all experimental trial and error type stuff. But if they're that troubling, then uh, let's have a conversation. Yeah, you, you raise a good point, macronutrients. Are you okay for a few minutes, Andrew? I'm fine, yeah, absolutely. Oh, brilliant. Abby, you've raised a very good point and something we, we hear about over and over. Let's see if we can try and um, 
Yeah, Andrew, I mean, how do you feel about writing for the Bear Facts about this? Because, I, But what I would like to do, and Linda, I know Linda's in the background there, people like Esther, one of our very prominent volunteers, she suffered this, and of course she's a lot better, she's had a liver transplant, but maybe we could be asking our members what helped you, and we could be sharing this information. And um, So Abby, anything that you come up with that you feel is helping, maybe don't cure it, and uh, there's a message here from Jean, of course, uh, Magnesium. We could maybe get some tips and get an article, get some doctor's comments if you're happy to give us some comments. And then let all of you put your tips in on this article so we can share some information. Would that be reasonable? Absolutely. I think you know, the more um, knowledge you know, we can share about what's worked for people, um, yeah. the yeah. better this there's a couple of studies out there. People have tried little bits and pieces with very, very variable success, but what works for well for one person just doesn't work well for the next. Yeah. So the, yeah. the the more shared experience and knowledge we can gather, I think the better for these really challenging areas, because this is yeah. this is definitely one of the really challenging oh, areas within, within and, hepatology. Yeah, and it's the same as the edge. You know, what works for one doesn't always work for the other. Some people don't Absolutely. respond to medication, but goodness me, they find they're putting Epsom salts in the bath is, is a trick. So let's just get on that. I know Chris is in the background. Chris, can you put that on the to-do list? Let's try and get this uh, sorted out, if you would, please. Um, I've got a great team behind us here. <laughs> It, and he's coming in. You're it, boy. <laughs> right. I am. <laughs> I, we're, we're still going good. What makes the ALT rise? This is a belter of a question. Mine has gone from 601 to 674, despite cutting out alcohol completely, eating healthy, lost 10 pounds, good on you, and a gym uh, a user and currently on our so. So that, it's a good question, isn't it? You said ALP or ALT? ALT. Alt, alt, A -L -T. A -L -T. So, I mean, 600 is is much higher than you'd normally see with PBC. So, yes, you see ALPs 5, 600, not uncommonly with PBC. But if the ALT is elevated in PBC, it's, it's normally in the, you know, the low uh, 10s, you know, 70s, 80s or, or a couple of hundred tops. So... It's always important to consider the sort of variant or overlap syndromes that people talk about. So could there be a bit of uh, autoimmune hepatitis there? If it's a new thing, could it be due to a drug reaction or some other sort of process that's going on there? So mm -hmm. it depends on how long it's been elevated for, but but certainly mm -hmm. if you've got an ALT of 600, then for me, if, if I was seeing that in, in, in a clinic, I would be considering, is there some other condition going on that's not just PBC? Yeah. Um, that requires a, a different form of treatment because that an ALT of 600 is, is really, you know, is, is quite high. Um, mm -hmm. And so it does bring into play other conditions like autoimmune hepatitis or or other things like drug reactions. So mm -hmm. certainly it, if it's that high, I, I, you know, mm -hmm. worthwhile having a conversation with your with, with your with your hospital team about um, whether yeah. the treatment you're on at the moment is the right treatment for that and whether you need any changes in your treatment if it's not coming down. Because that's the test that we like to try and get as close yeah. to normal as we can. Okay. And and well done, you. I mean, you must be reasonably well. If you go to the gym, you've lost 10 pounds mm -hmm. and everything. So absolutely well done. But yeah, do say that there was a question raised here and take it back to your team and say, could you, you, you uh, know a bit more about it? Um, I have more UTI after taking air so is this normal? I have more UTI. Uh, presumably, you mean urinary tract infections? Um, yeah. yeah, good question. There's no real mechanistic reason why you should have more mm. urinary tract infections from it. Um, mm. I mean, unfortunately, females are much more prone to, to getting urinary tract infections than, uh, than males for lots of uh, anatomical reasons. I mean, I think... Um, so, so the drug doesn't suppress your immune system, for example. It shouldn't change the constituents of your urine, so it shouldn't alter your sort of uh, mm. uh, urine to make that more likely. Um, gen generally speaking, I mean, I think you've got to be careful with certain medications and absorption, but cranberry juice can be helpful for, you know, for recurrent urinary tract infections. Um, sometimes, you know, some people, if you're having recurrent urinary tract infections, make sure it's not a, a chronic bladder issue, isn't it? So... You know, again, if you're suffering from these very frequently, is there some other um, yeah. non-PBC reason for that happening? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so it's always important to think that just because you have a, a, a relatively rare disease, not everything else that you suffer mm -hmm. from then will be directly related to either that condition 
mm. or to the treatment of it. So um, mm. many of these things are, are not related to either the PVC or the treatment of it. So um, mm. if you're having recurrent problems, they need to be evaluated on their own merits and not yeah. just all put down to, oh, it's your PVC, it's your PVC, yeah, it's your yeah, PVC. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, brilliant comment. The lady who asked to read the ALT, it's the ALP she meant. So it's alkaline phosphatase. Okay. So it makes perfect sense on you. <laughs> that's fine. Well that's, that, that, well, that's okay. That's good. It's good to get that clarity. And I think, yeah. um, so what I would say is that if you've been on your URSO for six months or more and your ALP is not falling, then you definitely need, you still need to have a conversation with your hospital team because you will be, um, you know, considered for second line treatments quite quickly with those, with those sorts of numbers. So you may well need a beta acid, acid um, or other treatments if that's not effective for you. So certainly if your ALP is greater than 600, more than six months after being on your URSO, um, I think that's a very strong indication yeah. for consideration yeah. of second line treatment. So have that conversation with your team. Yeah, do and and as I say, there's there's two there. There's Orca and, and there may be a piece of fibre, but absolutely, you you yeah. seem to go. Now we're going back to this Rudex. So I've got a couple of things. Yes, Medigene Medigen is developing Rudex as a modifying agent for the oral treatment of autoimmune diseases. According to the firm, Rudex can bind to the CD80 protein. Ah, oh, I saw it. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I've about this one, yeah. Interaction with the CD28 protein receptor over the surface of the T-cells and thus blocking yeah. a signal pathway of t God, I'm glad I went to accountancy and not medicine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so <laughs> I, I heard about these T-cell ones. So, so T-cells are uh, immune cells. And obviously, when you have an autoimmune condition, sometimes the B-cells send the wrong... B-cells produce antibodies, so they produce the signals and they, they sort of, you know, they're, they're sort of instructions to the other immune cells and then the t-cells tend to cause all the damage mm -hmm. um so the b-cells instruct the t-cells what to do and they do they do all the dirty work um so these sorts of things are to try and switch the t-cells off from from causing the damage to the bile ducts mm -hmm. so i think i think that's a trial that's being run within part of the uk um I think newcastle and, have got a yeah yeah so so I think certainly, as you said, Colette, we're very keen for people to partake in, mm -hmm. in clinical trials. And I think, yeah. you know, um, the team up in Newcastle have got a fantastic clinical trial set up. They, they run it extremely well. That they're, they're, they're very rigid with all the sort of necessarily safety mm -hmm. rules and, uh, you know, reporting mechanisms to make sure it's all uh, safe and appropriate. So, mm -hmm. so, yes, I mean, I think people are... are Approach for these clinical trials when you haven't already responded to it to, to a drug and so mm -hmm. therefore generally speaking are uh, part of what we would call a high-risk population um, mm -hmm. and so therefore we want to try and find new, new medications to help both you mm -hmm. and other people in the future so um, mm -hmm. as I said there will be a list of, of potential side effects within that I would again ask you to go back and do that I, this, this is not some sort of Mickey Mouse study this is a, a very plausible biological yeah. mechanism yeah by which, um, you know, it might help people with PBC. Um, and so would certainly, you know, if you feel comfortable, that's the key bit. You should never feel coerced into a clinical trial. Yeah. But re read what the side of profile says. If mm -hmm. there's bits that you're not happy with that, you can have a conversation with the trial team, um, with the nurse or, or, or the, or the um, principal investigators, as they're called at, at the site, and they can answer additional questions. And if you feel satisfied that, 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 that the risk to you is low, um, and you're willing to proceed, then then you can embark on it, and you'll be appropriately monitored by a very good trial team up there. Mm. That's fantastic. Well, we've come to the end of an absolutely fascinating afternoon, brilliant session, Andrew. Thank you very very much. So I uh, nobody think... asked about Paxlovid. I'm amazed. What's Paxlovid? With the new oral treatments for COVID. Ah, no, I've got a note. I forgot. What did you call it? So there's two there's two therapies there's molnupiravir and then there's uh, Paxlovid which is the which is the Pfizer oral treatment they're both at direct antivirals for treatment of covid in the community they're not oh. widely uh, available as of yet but there's they're going to be available increasingly uh, in the NHS um across across the UK in the week so they've been approved by the regulatory bodies at the end of December yeah. And then there's usually a sort of a 90 day sort of period of, by which they're working at the logistics of making them available. So they will be effectively treatments for people at higher risk of COVID complications. So from a liver disease perspective, that's people with 
um, decompensated cirrhosis, so that's ascites or variceal bleeding or encephalopathy, or um, people who've had a transplant or people with other immune diseases who are on immunosuppressant therapies. Um, and you need to take the treatment within five days of a positive test and you take it for five days. And it reduces your risk of hospitalization and severe consequences by about 80 to 90 percent. Now, brilliant, because it wasn't my list to ask you, but it was my list, which I tend to disregard. That's, right. That's interesting because people are being sent letters. I don't know anybody that's been sent a particular yeah. letter apart from me. And I was a bit miffed because I thought I, I because I'm just normal PVC, I don't have decomposition liver disease. Um, that I, I, found it, I wondered why I was singled out. And then I thought, well, maybe I was wrong that PVC, all people with PVC should be offered this. And then luckily I went to my consultant yesterday and I said, I got this letter from da 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 da. He says, I know what you're talking about. He says, but it's not for you. You're you're not ill. Yeah. It's it's not it's not for you. So you you that's brilliant. You've cleared that up as well. That is for people with late stage yes. uh, liver disease, PBC, or whatever. Um it anyway. might be Colette that that because you've had PBC for a long time, yeah. that yeah. um with the, with the way diseases or conditions are coded, it yeah. would have been coded as primary biliary cirrhosis, not primary biliary cholangitis. So when you do, uh, when when you do, um, so Public Health England keep lists of who's got what conditions that are coded. If they've gone to it, it will it will say the word cirrhosis there, and yeah. somebody has gone, oh, that's cirrhosis, therefore it triggers that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think I think yeah. that's, that that might happen for some people with PBC. Yeah. yeah. It was reassuring to know uh, my consultant say ignore it. <laughs> that, yeah. That's grand, but that's interesting. So, so there's two new um, medications, not just one. There's two. And that's that's two, yeah. really good to know. This has been a great session. I, I everybody out there, I really want to pick up on this uh, cramps thing that Abby's brought to our attention. Yeah, and get get in touch, Abby, with the with the nurse advice line or or my secretary. You, you know, right. the, you, you know the drill. <laughs> and you're going to write us a wee bit of the newsletter and we're going to ask our members if they would give us their experiences that might be helpful to other members. Um, we used to do this an awful lot. We, we stopped doing it because we got wrapped up in COVID, but we'll get back to it because it's a quality of life thing, isn't it? I mean, okay, it's, it's maybe not life threatening, but quality of life is all, isn't it? And if oh, it's just huge. It's, it's really miserable. The cramps are really miserable. <laughs> Uh, poor Abby. Well, I hope you get Abby sorted out. Report back, please. Somebody's at least put my glasses back on. I've been sent a PCR test to use if I develop symptoms and if positive, I have been able to get the antiviral drug. Okay, brilliant, good. good. So that, that that's that process, June. That and I think um in England, I think that's already happened. In Wales, it's yeah. happening very soon. Yeah. Um we, we've just been going through the clinical criteria this week just to make certain mm. that they are the right ones. Um, Scotland, I suspect, almost certainly will be doing the same thing if it hasn't done it already. So, well, I live um, in Scotland and I got the letter. Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't for me, baby. Right. Thank you. You've, you've been absolutely fantastic today, Andrew, as always. Thank you so, so much. Thank you to those in the background that make all this work. Thank you to your members. Please keep up with the questionnaires. And on, on that aside, if you're sitting, you're fed up, you're worried, you're concerned, pick up the phone. We don't do 95 Monday to Friday. There's always a, a, a number in the office and some machine. You can get any of us in the evenings or weekends. Do not ever hesitate to do that. We're more than happy to help because people are struggling at the moment. Oh, it looks like we are opening up, which is, is good news. But that brings its concerns as well. So don't hesitate to share. Andrew, thank you so, so much. Lots of love in Wales. We'll get down there soon and I'll get that glass of wine. Was that a wine or a coffee? 